I'm Monica and welcome to another episode of Youth Chat. Today we have a panel of uh, youth from the medical background um, and before we get started I'd just like to warn viewers that this episode will breach a couple of adult themes so please use your discretion when viewing it. And today we have Natalie, Peter, Mina and Marianne. So today we are talking about the topic of contraception and basically the idea of preventing pregnancy um, and just exactly where our church lies on certain methods and why we do or don't support them. So Marianne, uh, to start with you, could you give us a bit of an idea of why the church does allow most methods of contraception? Um, so I guess it's, it's also important to um, start off by saying that um, any advice that's given today should also be supported by your confession father. So um, make sure that before making any decisions, if you are getting married soon, make sure that you do um, consult the church first. So um, the question was, why does our church support most um, methods of contraception? So um, contraception is, um, uh, I guess, any method that prevents pregnancy. And our church um, has an acceptance of um, pregnancy being quite a big decision and having quite a big impact on a couple. So um, we understand that um, that decision will involve a lot of factors including you know, your financial situation, whether you are um, you know, physically able and emotionally able to um, support having a child and bringing them up um, in God's name and all of that is quite an involved process. Um, and I guess the, the other side of um, the decision is also looking at um, like whether or not we, um, if we outlaw contraception altogether, then what is the purpose that we get married? Is it purely for procreation? Is it purely that we only make children? Or is you know, love between the couple also an important thing in a marriage? So um, like to me, this is, this is why the church um, allows contraception, knowing that there are a lot of factors in a decision to um, bring a child into the world and it should be something that you're ready for. So that's, yes. yeah. No, that's really good. And, and just on the other flip side then, so there are certain methods we don't allow. Um, Natalie, did you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think any contraception method that um, works by after the sperm and the egg has met and fertilized, then that's something that w the church is against. And I guess that's because the process has already um, started um, and the um, conception has already taken place. So all the other methods that the church doesn't have an issue with is um, preventing that process from actually happening. The sperm and the egg haven't met yet, so um, it's accepted in the, in the eyes of the church. So. Um, I guess that's where the distinction lies. Yeah, so for example, what methods then come after that process has occurred? So things like the IUD, which is the intrauterine device, um, and this is a device which is put into the womb. Um, there are two types. There's the marina, which also has um, a female hormone coated um, on it, um, which also has another way of working. But the one without the... Um, the progesterone, which is the female hormone that the marina has, um, works by making the um, uterus an unfavorable environment for an already fertilized sperm and egg um, to then implant into the uterus or the womb. And then, so th that, that will be lost. So um, whereas the marina um, has an additional function where um, it makes, it, it it stops the fertilization from happening and also the implement implantation. So I think the, the main issue is the, uh, the IUD without the mm -hmm. progesterone. So it's all about you know, the timing and order of things. What yeah. about something like the morning after pill? So the morning after pill um, is one of a variety of pills which can be taken um, as a form of contraception. The other one being the oral contraceptive pill, which is the one you take every day to prevent um, conception from happening you know, in the long term. Whereas morning after pill is after conception, it's something you take to prevent um, pregnancy or conception from happening. And so 
the one you take beforehand, which is like every day, um, is, is allowed by the church. Uh, the morning after pill, which, which you've taken after you know, conception has already happened, is the one which isn't uh, accepted by the church. And again, it's because the timing issue. So the, the male sperm and the female egg have already theoretically or potentially have met already. And so taking a pill after that is essentially trying to get rid of what has already started and hence why the morning after pill isn't accepted by the church. Okay, and in terms of methods that we do allow, um, we've been talking sort of from a pharmacological or pharmacy sort of side of things. There's always, you know, the natural approach and our church is happy with all of those. Um, would you personally agree, Peter? Do you think this is a good idea? Uh, it, look, it's a very touchy subject, unfortunately, and you brought up a lot of the a lot of the different perspectives which are often thought about. So be it that um, sex is there only for the form of procreation or be it there that perhaps sex is there for the idea of uh, pleasure as well. And those are two big conflicting arguments, I think, things that are always brought up in this argument between whether we should use contraception or not. Um, my personal perspective, it's a bit left-winged, unfortunately. Uh, I am one who is very, very touchy when it comes to the idea of contraception. I'd rather not use it if I didn't have to. Uh, but having said that though, it's, it's very easy to start saying these things when push comes to shove and you're actually in a situation where contraception is an option. Um, I think it's a definitely something worth taking into account and worth thinking about. And as you said, definitely worth discussing with either your confession father, uh, also discussing with your partner as well and with anybody else who you think is worth discussing it with. Um, including, say, family planning or whatnot. Uh, if we did have nothing like contraception, who knows what kind of problems we'd have, uh, be it unseen pregnancies and stuff, and perhaps putting too many children up for like adoption or, or crises within families. I mean, it can cost not only monetary, but it can also cost um, a lot more, like in the heart and a lot in the head as well. It can really play with emotions and a lot of stuff like that. That's the other, other side of contraception, I guess. Mm. Okay, and what about the idea then of keeping the child and, and putting them up for adoption if you're not ready, I, I, which is what you're saying, essentially? Yeah, so uh, I probably shouldn't have touched on <laughs> the whole idea of adoption, to be honest, because it is more about contraception and what we think about it. But I, I do want to say that, um, that, like, explain what actually is happening. So what we're saying in terms of what's allowed and what's not allowed, uh, what happens is usually the sperm will be in the uterus and it has to make it to the egg. Um, what we usually do is, by giving medications or giving things from outside of the body, um, either we stop the sperm from making it to the egg from the start, so the sperm doesn't make it there at all, meaning that it can't actually get to the egg and fertilize the egg at all. Or the other option is when the sperm makes it to the egg and is about to become uh, a, a different, site, uh, different form, I guess, um, we can give things to stop that from actually implanting in the wall of the uterus and actually being able to grow and grab nutrients from the mother. Uh, in saying that, it's important to define what our church believes is life and what isn't. And we believe that once the sperm meets the egg, it truly is a baby. And that's why our, we have differences in what types of contraception we use. Yeah. Does anyone know? So I think, yeah, just in case anyone's a little bit lost mm. in, from all the terms, so the church is accepting of certain forms of contraception, ones which prevent formation of that, that kind of new life, which is sure. when male sperm meets with the female egg. So anything before that the church is fine with, um, and anything after that the church is against, because essentially you're, you know, you're ending that life. And so we've already mentioned a few of the, you know, the oral contraceptive pill, um, and then there's I don't think we've touched on it yet, but you know the natural kind of family planning sort mm -hmm. of thing, where um, it's a, a method of contraception whereby a woman you know monitors her temperature and uh, her other things, and in terms of figuring out where she is in her cycle when she's most fertile, um, and using that as a basis of um, timing whether you know you want to conceive or whether you don't want to conceive. Um, and then there's also physical barrier methods, so things like condoms, um, which are also accepted by the church because they prevent the sperm and the egg from meeting. Um, so other things which weren't allowed, 
we said the morning, morning after, after pill, pill. Um, and then the copper IUD, IUD the, the intrauterine device, which is inside. Um, and so I know you kind of touched on adoption, but I think that's very, very later on down the yeah. track. So I guess, are we likening morning after pill to abortion? Is that the track that, do we all agree then that that's the, the church's standpoint, that this is a life that we are aborting at that yeah, point? I personally, from my personal perspective, I, I liken them together. Mm -hmm. So I look at the morning after pill being the same thing as abortion. So there is already, and this is just a personal point of view, I mean, you're all welcome to bring your own view to the table, but I think once the egg has met the sperm, we shouldn't intervene at all. Um, we shouldn't be able to stop that from happening, stop pregnancy from happening if it was meant to. It's, it's all up to God and, and what he's created. If it is all up to God, just to play the devil's advocate, it's not mm. actually my opinion, Please. but uh, a lot of other denominations are quite against um, contraception completely. Um, or the barrier methods like Mina was talking about, pretty much every type of co uh, contraception except for family planning. Um, if it is up to God, how come we don't have that standpoint as well? Why does the church allow some forms and not others? Um, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about because what does the Bible actually say about it? We obviously know that do not murder and abortion is very clear, but what happens beforehand? I mean, the Bible says, be fruitful and multiply. How far do you take that? Be fruitful and multiply every time you're with your partner intimately, or is it just a, a framework that marriage should be built upon? You meant to get married and you know multiply and and as you said, there are some ramifications as well. If if there is no limit and there is absolutely no contraception, every family had a 14 children. What's that going to mean for society? Are you going to be able to introduce Christ to every single one of them? Are you going to be able to provide them with a life that, you know, you were meant to provide them with? Um, I mean, these are all issues that need to be considered as well. And I mean, our church isn't against all medical interventions in other areas of life. Uh, we've just applied this to contraception, but you know, we've previously discussed things like euthanasia versus any other medical intervention to prolong life. There is a difference. This is something where we do accept some medical interventions. It's just the time at which it falls into a sin, according to the Bible, that's where we take a standpoint as Christians. So it is, it is black and white, in my opinion. I agree with you both. Um, but at the same time, it shouldn't be an all or nothing rule. The church is understanding and does have a, a point at which this is now a child. This life has occurred and we shouldn't intervene past there. I mean, a, as future doctors, how would you deal with that situation? Say you were requested by someone or, or someone was asking your advice about contraception. How would you approach that? I think it's, yeah, it's an issue that we're always presented with. It's one that I've always thought about myself as well. Um, one that I've also changed my opinion of a number of times as well. Um, if I was, say, a doctor working in a metropolitan city, a city where access to healthcare was nice and easy, and if I wasn't to provide something, I'd go to the doctor next door and grab it, there's a good chance I'd lean to not prescribing or not pointing patients in the direction of the morning after pill. I wouldn't be one to sit there pushing it and trying to educate people a lot about it. Uh, I'd rather it be swept under the rug and we don't know about it, and it kind of phases out. If I did live in something like a rural town, a town where access to healthcare is very, very hard, and, and unfortunate things can happen and you're the only healthcare practitioner for, who knows, could be 400 kilometres, could be more. Um, I think my ideas would change. And uh, once again, this is going down the tang tangent again, but it's, it's, it is something that we are always thinking about. Be it you are a doctor in a rural situation or a doctor in a metropolitan situation, it is something that we do have to think about. Um, I, I think I've shared my personal opinion about it. Does anyone think differently about it though? Um, it's important also to know, like, just to, I guess, accept that pregnancy is not the only, like, outcome of this. The, the other um, is, say a girl did get pregnant and, you know, she's in a situation where she can't, she can't go through with the pregnancy or, um, you know, the circumstances were extremely difficult and she can't bring a child into the world or she, you know, can't support a child after, you know, she has the child, then um, are we going to risk then um, like women harming themselves or 
you know, taking matters into their own hands where they abort a child themselves. So that's, that's the reason that abortion is legal in Australia because we don't want women to be doing things that are going to be extremely dangerous um, in order to take things into their own hands. So pregnancy isn't the only outcome. It's, it's important to be very supportive of a woman regardless of the circumstances that she's in and um, to know like the different options that you can present to someone when they come to you. So. Yeah, and that opens up a whole can of worms of the idea of abortion and what to do next. Um, so we'll have to come back to that point um, just after a short break. everyone, welcome back to our show. If you've just joined us, I'd like to remind you that this episode does have a few adult themes that we speak about, so please use your discretion when viewing it. And so just before the break, we mentioned a few methods of contraception. We were talking about things like the oral contraceptive pill, condoms, IUD and natural methods. Uh, is there anything else that anyone wanted to add before uh, we go on? Yeah, so I did want to add that Amongst all the things that we did mention, uh, there's also the method of withdrawal. Uh, withdrawal is when a man will withdraw from a female prior to ejaculation. Uh, and it's, well, while theoretically it should be um, dependable, it unfortunately not, isn't very dependent at all, uh, only because we rely on a large amount of self-control. And self-control can't always be relied upon, unfortunately. So while it is also another method it's not something that I don't think any of us would recommend at all, unfortunately. Mm. And just on that, Pete, um, so it's not very effective, you're right, and it's probably one of the least effective methods. Um, but it's also worthwhile to mention that really no method of contraception is 100% guaranteed, even sure. things like the condom or you know, the contraceptive pill or you know, the IUDs and hormones and things, they're not 100% guaranteed to work. No, that's true, and that's especially important when we're dealing with something like contraception because pregnancy is not the only adverse outcome that we're worried about here. So before we uh, went away to the break, Marianne, you were making an interesting point on that note. Yeah, so um, while pregnancy is you know, a great outcome in um, a lot of circumstances, um, we also have to look at um, the consequences of banning contraception and what that could mean to a couple or to a woman who has found herself to be pregnant. Um, so another consequence that we have to consider is what if um, you know the woman is pregnant and now has no other option but to you know have to harm her body or to somehow intervene herself in order to remove the pregnancy, like to remove the child that is now conceived. So that is another consequence of banning contraception. It's, it's important that we consider that before, um, you know, the church takes any hard line you know, about um, banning contraception. Okay, and on that note, I'm going to say something, you guys feel free to disagree with me if you, if you feel that way. But I think this idea of, okay, so she might resort to abortion, is what I understand. And I think the morning after pill is on the same spectrum as that. It's just obviously an earlier form. And in a situation where someone can't um, foreseeably bring this child into the world, should it not be an option available to people? The morning after pill yeah. is an option? I, well, I don't think so. I think it's quite black and white. Um, once the, there has been fertilisation, then that's when life starts. So how is it any different to abortion? or um, it, it doesn't matter what, at what point it occurs. Um, even, I mean, the only, re the only time that the church allows abortion is if the mother's life is at risk, not if um, she will go through unfavorable circumstances. I mean, it has to be black and white because this is life or death, it's murder. It's essentially murder. Life has begun and you've taken it away. Um, that's something that cannot be, um, you know, flexible because life has started and unless you can't exchange one life for another but two wrongs also don't make a right and it's not an eye for an eye or, you know, uh, the, I think it's quite clear that once life has started it's not um, the mother's decision to to end that life. Mm -hmm. I, com I completely agree with Natalie on this one. So, I mean, I know that whilst it may be thought of as, okay, this woman might not be able to raise this child, um, there, there should definitely be no sort of thinking of, okay, well, if I end this child's life, 
maybe you know that'll be a bit better for the woman and just like Natalie said two wrongs you know won't make a right so even though it may be very difficult for the woman and she may be going through a lot um, and you know it's important to be sensitive and you know obviously none of us have really been there I don't think we should be um, even considering the fact that maybe killing this innocent you know child who's been potentially going to grow up and do who knows what um, getting rid of their life um, as a method of you know okay well you know my life will be a bit better if, for whatever reason and I, I know it might sound a little bit insensitive but it's important to to kind of go back to the basics whereas you are potentially killing a child because it's after conception um, and you know the only acceptable reason is if that woman you know that mother's life is in danger you know of death you know the pregnancy may lead to death or something you know really bad but otherwise <coughs> as Christians it should be very black and white um, and although you know this the different scenarios may vary you know whatever the circumstances are for the woman it's important that they're considered but at the end of the day you know the church is very clear that you know we're not just going to offer abortion or the morning after pill um, as a means of making your life a bit easier um, and again without sounding too insensitive you know it's it sometimes comes down to taking responsibility for your actions in some cases um, in some other cases you know whether things have been you know unfortunate or unlucky almost it's important again just to remember that killing this this child this innocent child is not the answer mm -hmm. there, there may be other things to do for example you know adoption maybe later on if, if you continue with the pregnancy this young child you know it may be up for adoption or you who knows I mean throughout the duration of the pregnancy may change your mind you know it's a decision which you might make or might think you need to make at the start of a pregnancy um, but there there are always other options rather than just you know killing this innocent child and again it's important to not sound insensitive when I when I say it. obviously these situations are very you know emotionally and psychologically you know serious and I think it's just important to remember that the church's view is you know we're not going to kill this child there are other ways mm -hmm. so it sounds like pretty much unopposed here yeah Peter, I, I agree, agree with you as well so it, it does unfortunately sound incredibly insensitive and ne none of us have been in that situation before but it is is a child's life which you're playing with at the end of the day mm. so there's a child in this womb um, there's already a soul which has been granted to it and we aren't here to be taking that away it's it's not our part to play so yes it does sound insensitive but it's a whole lot more insensitive to be killing an unborn child I think and to personalize that like I like to think of the example of St Mary like mother of our church like she um, obviously was in circumstances where she wasn't married and she's found herself to be pregnant and you know um, like we we don't have enough information to know detail of what happened but obviously um, she was in a community where you know falling pregnant outside of pregnancy was extremely shameful and she bore that shame and she bore the, the scorn that would have come with that and like to personalize that if you if you do find yourself in that situation you are pregnant and it wasn't planned or it was you know a, the product of you know a very um, unhappy event then um, you have to um, just remember that God's will is definitely um, within everything that happens in this world like it, it is God's will that this child um, now has a soul now has a spirit and will have a life so um, always remember that you know you're not alone God does um, have control of situations that we don't necessarily have control of so regardless of what the medical or the um, you know financial or monetary um, f um, consequences of this might be you have to remember that God's will is um, definitely present and God you know has has a reason for these things taking place so don't don't feel like you're alone and yeah, no, yeah. yeah. some might argue that I mean this is coming from a perspective outside of the church people might argue that it doesn't have a life yet that it doesn't have a soul but I think it's important to say that us as Coptic Orthodox people do agree that once the egg meets the sperm it does have a life it has a soul if we don't think we can prove that well then I guess you might term it as a bit of a grey area but because it is a grey area it's not even worth the risk mm -hmm. not worth the risk at all but being Christians we do believe it's a child and I'm not going to play with killing a child's life that's for sure
No, I agree with you. And it's like a lot of things, um, the church's perspective towards medical advancements in any area, mm. not just contraception. We always take it up to that line. Um, you know, if this is a line that is biblically proven, you know, you cannot, do not murder. It's mm. one of the commandments we must obey. Okay. So in that case, then, uh, yeah, it is pretty black and white. I agree with you. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone have any other thoughts on contraception as a whole or where our church stands? Well, I mean, I think we're we're quite lucky, I guess, if you want to put it that way, in the in the Coptic Church that you know some forms of contraception are are acceptable and uh, our church is happy for us to use. Um, I, and you know the contrast would be some other Christian denominations who completely you know are against any form of contraception. Um, so it's I guess it shows that our church is. Um, although staying very true and orthodox to the, to the faith and to what, you know, was started 2,000 years ago, that it's it's not, you know, an older, you know, black and white kind of olden day church. It does take into account, you know, medical advances and, and the current age and, and, and is trying, you know, and is coming up with, you know, good guidelines for us to use as, as modern day Christians. Um, doesn't matter what field you're in or what sort of things you do, but it's it's always there as, I guess, a sh- shoulder for us to yeah. lean on. And on that note, I think we implore you, the public as well, to always do your own research as well. With technology always changing, there's going to be new things coming out, things that we don't even know yet. So go, going back to what we were saying earlier in terms of which contraceptive forms our church allows and which contraceptive forms our church doesn't, um, this it might be something that you're watching in a few months' time, in a few years' time. It may be outdated information when you watch it. Who knows? You're on the World Wide Web. So um, it's worth doing your own, ed- uh, your own education, looking for your own stuff, seeking out people to talk to, even be it your confession father or your personal doctor or, or something like that, just to get that little bit more information and b- make your decision process part of it as well. It's not just the church telling you what to do. You're part of this as well. It, it definitely affects a life, not just a medical condition or anything. Mm. Yes, and as Mina said, we are very lucky that yeah. our church does keep abreast with these changes and isn't um, sort of dictating in a way. We do have a lot of methods available to us. It's actually only a couple that are considered forbidden fruit in a way. So we should just, um, in, the, in that sense, we should be thankful actually that our church recognises, as Marianne was saying at the very beginning, that marriage is a lot more than just about procreating and there's no shame in that there's no lust within marriage but at the same time you know keep um, uh, keep an eye on crossing that boundary that we should never enter to can we quickly go through which ones were allowed by the church and which ones were omitted at all or natalie did you want to go through <laughs> <laughs> um okay so anything that stops um the, the meeting of the egg and the sperm um, is okay, but once that has taken place, then it's not okay. So family planning, the withdrawal method, um, condoms um, and other barrier methods, um, the oral contraceptive pill, they're, they're all fine um, and accepted by the church because they all um, occur before that fertilization of the egg and the sperm. Anything after that um, is not um, okay by the church. Um, like the morning after pill, like we discussed. Yeah. Sure. And any other thoughts before we wrap up? Um, just, I guess, a final reminder that contraception is, uh, you know, something which is all, well, pretty much mostly man made, and so it is not 100%. Um, so it's important just to know what, I guess, not just the church's view on things, but also if it's a medical sort of thing like the pill or you know the intrauterine devices or things like that you know they they do have an effect on your body there are side effects to these things so it's i guess it's all about just going out there just like Pete said and maybe just doing a little bit of research as to what the church or your confession father thinks is a you know is a good way to go and then knowing what that could potentially do to you and choosing what's best for you know your specific situation your specific scenario um, you know, and just being okay with, you know, 
of what you choose. And having done that research, let us know if you have any questions as well. Um, there's a few different methods I think they can contact us by. Yeah, so we have a Twitter handle, at CYC now. So feel free, if you want to contact us, ask us any questions. It would be lovely to hear them. Yeah, sweet. So We've also got a Facebook page, uh, the Christian Youth Channel. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you. Hope you learnt something. And once again, feel free to ask Confession Father and Doctor for more advice. Thank you.